All right, everybody, we're going to get started. My name is Marcus Lashley, and I'm a recent graduate at NC State and now postdoc. So uh, I'm going to be introducing the speakers today. Uh, the first thing I want to do is make an announcement. If you're interested in the drone tracking, that will be at 5 o'clock today in this room, the workshop on it. So if you're interested in that, keep that in mind. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, we can get started. We have a few handouts coming around, and I think we have some jump drives as well. So be looking for those. Uh, they should be passing around the room now. So uh, first, the first speaker is, is Oz Garten, and he is from the Department of Fish and Wildlife Sciences at the University of Idaho. And uh, he's going to be talking about synoptic modeling of animal movement. So uh, should be a good time. Oz? Thanks. One of those handouts myself. Thanks. Uh, as he said, I'm Oz Garten. I'm a emeritus faculty. I retired actually now from the University of Idaho. And I've gotten to work on a bunch of really interesting methods over the past 35 years that I worked at the University of Idaho. And this little handout that's coming around is sort of the the summary of what I call a systematic process for analyzing location data using synoptic models. So I want to sort of outline what we're going to talk about and look through the things. So I want to demonstrate a new approach to analysis, somewhat new, it was published in 07, um, called synoptic models. And what I am putting forward and suggesting is a 12-step program <laughs> based on a new philosophy for analysis of animal locations. I'm going to show you examples with white rhinos, mountain goats, and Alaska caribou. We have examples from a whole variety of other species, but there's only time to cover some of them. I want to go through two tutorials. Um, one is a neat program called Animal Space Use that evaluates home range models. Well, we call them null models because it's sort of the model you start with to do a synoptic analysis um, using a synoptic model. And it simultaneously estimates home range and resource selection at once. It integrates those things together into one analysis. That's what synoptic means, summary of those things together. So the time schedule, there's a lot to cover <laughs> in, in an hour. I want to begin with six to eight minutes of a quick introduction, which if you look at your handout, are basically steps one through six in that outline. And I'm going to just wail through those quickly because they're kind of beginning things that you need to start with. Then um, I want to load uh, the synoptic space model onto your hard drive. So we have flash drives passing around. Um, and you can run the installation of this animal space use program on your computer um, for use at step six if you're going to do through, go through the things that we're doing. If you don't um, want to do that right now, then note at the very bottom of the back side of the handout, it lists a, a website that I maintain at the University of Idaho called Population Ecology. So if you go to that website, you can download everything that's on that, that jump drive. So you don't need to worry about doing it if you don't want to right now. But you're welcome to if you brought, if you brought a computer with you and want to, to do that. So I would encourage you to load that while we're talking this first six or seven minutes. And then we'll run the animal space use program. So that'll be the first part of the tutorial. It'll take about 10 minutes to run through that. Then um, we'll open R and we'll start uh, the synoptic model. We'll start it with a script that's on that jump drive or available at those sites. And that'll start running. That'll take us about 10 minutes to get that going. And then while that's doing, for the last 20 minutes, we'll run through the remaining steps, 7 through 12, on the handout. And we'll jump back and forth between those and looking at how the R program is doing. Because it's a program, it's an interpreted language, so it doesn't run as fast as compiled languages. So it takes longer for the thing to, to run. OK, on the back side of the handout, then, are some critical equations for um, relationships that are fundamental to the synoptic model. And then there's key references. And on the, the jump drive, there are copies of all the papers that my students and I have published that are listed there. Um, plus, there, there's a, 
a, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation um, for you to use, so you don't really need to make detailed notes or anything if you don't want to. Okay, any questions? Yes, please. So how did the handouts all get passed out? Great. So keep your hands up while she passes around. Other questions? OK, great. Let's uh, start wailing forward, because we have a bunch of things to cover there. OK, the whole idea between what I'm putting forward here is a new philosophy towards the analysis of animal movement data. Rather than simply drawing a boundary around an animal's locations, let's ask important ecological questions with that data. Now, how have we done that in the past? Well, modeling animal locations in the past has really consisted of three alternatives. One is to estimate a home range, the area used by an animal as it goes about its business reproducing, eating, and not getting eaten. Or alternately, we do an analysis of resource selection, try and estimate or identify the disproportionate use of some areas over other areas when compared to what was available. And then a third alternative that hasn't been so widely used is called a movement model. And that's exactly what was being talked about in the, the introductory keynote. And we, we're trying to describe fine scale patterns of movement on spatial locations utilized. What I'm proposing is something different that integrates those things together into one synoptic approach. And the idea is a model building approach to ask questions by putting forward models that we think might describe the patterns of use and then evaluate those models with the location data. So let's really ask interesting, important ecological questions about the animals using the data that we gather. So how do we do that? Well, as in classic statistical approach, we start with an initial null model. Things that are, say, based on the idea that this animal during its breeding period has site fidelity. It stays fixed in this area. Or during its winter, wintering period, it stays fixed in this area. Or during the movement patterns, when it's moving and migrating, we want to look at some model of its movement across the landscape. So those are kind of alternatives but we can use either of those as null models. And I'll show you a bunch of possibilities for those, though I won't have time to talk hardly at all about the fine scale movement model sort of things. Second, then, we should combine that movement data with information about the habitat, the resources that are available, and, and evaluate potential habitat associations that the animal makes. Likewise, we should look at interrelationships with other animals or with people or with human development type activities. How do we do that? Well, we have location data. We combine it with coverages that describe the habitat or other animal abundance, like can be density sort of thing, kernel maps of densities of, of, the, of say, males of the same species, if we're talking about a male or whatever, that kind of stuff. And we use a, an information theoretic approach to assess multiple models that we put forward that incorporate those what we think are important hypotheses about what might be driving that animal's pattern of habitat association. We use those tools like Akaiki's information criteria, AIC, to identify the best synoptic model or set of models. Often there's multiple models that are supported. And then we use that information to make predictions and to, and to make inference to what is liable to happen in the future. That's commonly what we're striving for, to get this information, to use it to make good management decisions to, for conservation or for whatever we're about. Okay, so what are the steps? So I'm going to start going through the 12 steps that are listed on the handout. We begin by stating the research questions clearly with details of why location data are required to answer it or answer them. So. Specifically, what types of data are necessary? What's the scale and order? If you're familiar with the multiple scale and orders of selection, we want to identify which one is critical and how will they be used to answer the key questions. So let me sort of lay that out for you. Let's look at a neat data set. This was gathered by Janet Racklow, who's one of my co-authors. She did her PhD dissertation 15 years ago in Africa, working on Matobo National Park in Zimbabwe, and she was looking at white rhino. So you can see here, there's some 
animals, some rhinos out there. And the first thing you would, should note is the habitat. What does it look like? Well, for example, the topography in general is flat, but note that there are some steep areas. And as you would guess, rhinos can't go up any of those steep slopes. So that topography ought to be very important because those things are granite outcrops. Second, we know that rhinos forage on grass, so there's grass that occurs in lots of areas, so they are gonna be probably using that. So we think that might be important in describing areas that they use. The third important point is that there's a boundary fence. No rhinos exist in Africa unless they're protected in general, practically by a boundary fence. But that boundary fence causes all kinds of nightmares if you're going to try and use a kernel on anything where you have a sharp boundary. If you ever mess with that, it just drives you crazy. It starts saying the animals are way beyond the fence. That's nonsense. This method is dramatically better than that because you lay a boundary around the thing, and that's where it says the animal can possibly be. So that's part of the analysis. A next important factor is that adult males are very territorial. We're going to be using data on three adult males that Janet worked on. And this is a great example of a kind of low-tech uh, project and analysis because she didn't have radio transmitters on animals, but she could identify individual males by scars and where they spent time. The three, there were three males that were territorial and defended territories. So we're going to only work on that data. She gathered data on all kinds of things, but we're going to focus on those three males that were territorial. And we want to ask, what is their space use and what are the factors? So the males are territorial. We wouldn't expect them, them to overlap much in territories. And so that says something about the kind or shape of the home range. And we're going to use that in our analysis when we build null models. Second, females are what the males are protecting <laughs> because they want to have breeding rights to those, and they occur in groups where the grass is most lush. And we can identify that with things like NDVI. So all those things lead to ideas, important sort of factors that we could build into our analysis. The second example I'm going to just cover very quickly is about mountain goats. And this is the PhD dissertation that by Adam Wells, one of my students, and the question was sort of more general. Where do, animal, where do mountain goats live and why there? So could we use a synoptic model to assess human impacts and the potential value of reintroduction sites? Because the species has been dramatically decreased way in the past in the 30s and 40s. Now they're re being reintroduced to new areas. The question is, what's the best places to reintroduce them? And we can do that based on looking at information on what their space they're using now and use that to forecast what might be the best places. Now, this is the other extreme of data from Janet's. Adam's stuff was based on hundreds of thousands of GPS locations. He had more than 50 mountain goats, distributed males and females, that he got data typically as, as frequent as about once every three hours for years for different animals. So this is the other extreme. So we're going to show you then that example as different style of data that you can still use synaptic, synoptic models on very successfully. So to orient you, here I'm going to use my pointer on my computer so it points a boat. We're talking about animals that occur right here in this extension of the distribution of the species in Washington. That's the zone that we're going to talk about. And, and Adam had animals throughout this entire zone with radio tags on them that he got GPS locations from. Okay, now this was supported by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. They put GPS collars on. They did census and sightability work. They worked on harvest effects, diseases, and genetics. What they asked us to work on was space use, home range, and habitat or resource selection. So that's what we're going to talk about. And just to give you an introduction to what you end up with, here's then a synoptic model of habitat selection and space use for one of his mountain goats. So on the right, you can see the, the equivalent of a orthophoto quad with the locations just during a couple month period of the summer when they're foraging very heavily, that females are finding food so that they can provide milk for their young, okay? And so these are the locations. Then when we did this synoptic analysis, we ended up being able to draw a model that looks like this. 
This, in fact, the red, bright red, is the highest probability of use, grading into the lightest color being the lowest probability of use. Now, that curve, you can see that that is a very complicated thing. But I'll tell you, that is not based on a kernel estimator. That's based on a, a, a parametric estimator, like a bivariate normal sort of whole range combined with resource selection functions. And I'll show you that, how that works. So that's what the synoptic model is. It uses some kind of parametric estimator of the fixed area of use, and then it adds to that the effects of resource selection. And it draws a phenomenally detailed sort of home range. And that's a PDF. It's a probability density function. It's the probability of finding the animals in those places as those shaded colors. That's what you end up with. And this is enormous data set, but we were able to then, it was so big, we could bring it down to only a two-month period that was a very important season, and that we had lots of observations for individual animals in that period. In contrast, Janet's data was spread over a year and a half or two years, and it was, she only ended up with 30 or 40 animal observations per animal over that entire period. But it's reasonable to consider that whole time period because there isn't any big seasonality or anything going on in that. So that's very different kind of data sets. The same approach really works slick. Then the third example that we'll actually use some run some things that are on that spread dive, and I'll show you when we run the R program to do it, is this set of data. It's based on caribou that were marked with VHS collars, and we gathered information. These are actually animals that um, occur along the highway that runs um, up to the Prudhoe Bay field, so that's, the, that's the, where the... Uh, pipeline goes and the haul road goes, and these are other small roads. And this then portrays the vegetation and the habitats that were there. So this is some of the higher elevation ridges sort of things. And so we had, ooh, I'm sorry, that is cut off a little bit. We have covariates of elevation, slope, vegetation types, and roads that were available. And so we're going to use those. And this is, again, a smaller data set of only 30 to 50 observations per animal spread over. Actually, this was gathered over a bunch of years because the biologists could only get up there occasionally to get locations. They didn't have a lot of funding to do it. So those are the three data sets we'll look at and carry through the analyses as we zip through this. OK, second step, define the animal population of interest and the sampling approach providing in inference to it. Ideally, we should draw samples of individuals randomly, but more I typically, we must use stratified random um, samples, and I'll show you about that. So the third point is to identify potentially important strata. For example, age and sex and behavior differences of animals, like males versus females, residents versus migrants, breeders, all those things are very important. You don't want to mix those things. You're going to do an analysis. You want to work on multiple individuals of a particular type, a particular stratum. So you get the idea? If you mix things, you can end up with real mush. So I really encourage you. Now, that's one of the great powers of GPS data locations. We can get lots of locations. We can break them into important temporal seasons. For example, what's going on during breeding? What are they doing in the summer, fall, migration to winter range, winter, migration to summer range? Those are classic seasons that we should break our data into when we have lots of locations like we get with GPS sort of locations. Now, why is this important? Well, if you do uh, one of these models, and I mentioned this synoptic model, if you use a synoptic model based on a bivariate normal sort of analysis, you can actually evaluate, is there a difference, say, like between males and females in the summer? And what we find is that there's a very highly significant difference. So you want to break those seasons separately. And here's sort of a highlight. This is from Adam's work of what you see as the difference. Okay, if you look at things like distance to escape terrain for all animals, you get a value of minus 3.92. That's a selection coefficient. That means that the further you are from escape terrain, the lower the probability of using an area. So you have to actually maze it to a power of E to calculate. You can actually do an odds ratio sort of estimate of the likelihood of use. But look what happens if you take males alone or females alone. These are none of these for the all animals combined are significant. But if you look at males alone, you find the selection coefficient is about 10. 
meaning that the likelihood of using an area goes up dramatically, like on the order of tenfold, the further the animals are away from escape terrain. Now that's weird because we think of mountain goats as hanging out near escape terrain, but look at the female. The female is exactly the opposite. It's negative. So the farther you are away from the escape train, the lower the probability of finding females. Absolutely diametrically opposite selection between those two sexes. You can't mix those. So we'll talk about that. Fourth, let's select the type of analysis we're going to use. Now you could model space use with a synoptic model combining home range with resource or habitat selection. You could use, you could model movements with a synoptic model combining movement model with resource habitat selection. So one of my students and I, John Horn and I, developed a method ideal for GPS location um, sort of data um, that's, that can be used for that, but we don't have really time to talk about it. It's called Brownian movement model. It, the null model is random movement between known fixed locations where you incorporate the error in all your locations and deal with all that. You can do this synoptic model so you bring habitat in that at the same time. We don't have time to cover that, but there's, you, have, you have reprints and so forth of it. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate this approach after step five, but an alternative exists and dominates the analysis now. What's that? What's the way that everybody analyzes home range now? Almost everybody. <laughs> kernel analysis. If you do kernel analysis, you can't do any of this. This is a completely different alternative, okay? So that's a key point. Now there are other things out there. We'll briefly cover them. Okay, so the fifth point. Let, we want to begin by listing interesting, important ideas or hypotheses about the ecological factors, processes, or drivers determining patterns of space use. For example, what's the probability of encountering potential mates? Well, that ought to be a driver, so we ought to, in fact, portray that. For example, for rhinos, we, Janet Racklow kept track of, she did <clears throat> surveys through that Matobo National Forest week, I mean, National Park weekly, and plotted locations of every female that she saw. So we could build a great kernel map of the density of females through time. That is a very potentially important predictor for where you find male rhinos, because that's what they're doing. They're protecting those females. What about an animal like a bird that's provisioning a nest? Well, that ought to be very important. And what would you expect as its pattern of movement around that nest? Well, we have some theoretical models. And they say, for example, um, that a female wandering at random out but trying to collect resources as short and bring them as short a time as possible, in fact, might show sort of a circular normal bell-shaped sort of distribution. There's some theory that says, in fact, that a circular normal or a bivariate normal, sort of a squashed bell-shaped distribution, would be what you would expect if that female is doing central place foraging. That's what the, we describe that as. Or likewise, a mammal provisioning a den, the same thing. So that's a reasonable null model of their pattern at use. What about movements to water or to salt licks? Well, we ought to know where those things are, incorporate them into our analysis, and describe their home range. What about food resources or cover requirements? Those things are very important. So we need to, we can have coverages that can describe those, and let's incorporate that into our analysis of space use. What about energetic demands? I mentioned that rhinos can't climb steep hills, so in fact, the slopes may be very important. They can't cover certain of them, so that ought to be a good predictor. What about the density of intraspecific or interspecific competitors? So like for rhinos, the density of females, for the density of males that potentially compete with them. Potentially ought to be important. And then finally, a factor might be like the probability of encountering predators or hunters or poachers. Okay, those are all factors that we would like to be able to analyze. We can use movement data to do that. People are not doing it, but we ought to be. We've got the methods to do it. That's what I'm trying to teach you about. Okay, so here's then our picture again of the rhino, and right there on the right then is that list we just made of the factors that we would be, we should be able to build sort of models and predict how they will influence where we find these male rhinos. The topography, we can look at that in terms of slope, where there is granite outcrops, 
We can look where there's grass forage. We, in fact, have NDVI. We can get that for the park and map it. The boundary fence. They're not going to leave the boundary fence, so that ought to be part of our analysis. Social behavior, the males are very territorial. So males being territorial means that they wouldn't necessarily be moving out from a central place. Instead, we might expect that they would be moving broadly around in this home range or territory and not leave the boundaries of it hardly at all, in fact, but, but in a sense kind of patrol it. So there would be really heavy use in that territory and then almost nothing outside of it. And multiple males ought to have non-overlapping home ranges. We can model that. We can build that into our hypotheses. Okay, so for our rhinos, the topography flat with grounded outcrops, the, they prefer grass for foraging, the social behavior, territorial males around female concentrations. So since males defend territories to ensure breeding opportunities, they must forage on grass and flat areas that are kept within the boundary fence we might ask important questions. Do males choose and defend areas with high female densities? We have location data. Let's use it to ask that question. Or do they use flat areas with forage? Or do they use both? And how important are they? And what's their patterns of selection for those things? Six. OK, six step. Select the null model of space use. And what do we choose? Well, if the animals need to provision a nest or a den or rest in a known safe area, a hiding cover, for example, or roost, we would expect that they would have random movement out away from that. And in fact, as I said, there's theory that predicts that that would follow some kind of a circular normal distribution or a bivariate, a squashed normal sort of distribution. So that would be reasonable null models. What about rhinos that need to defend a territory? Well, in fact, we ought to have a sort of a flat-topped distribution rather than being a central point that they're moving out from. So we can use that as our null model. What about individuals that have two fuzzi, like an owl's nest and its roost, two different places in its home range that it often spends time at and moves out from? Or a den for wolves and a rendezvous site that they move the pups to through the, in part of the breeding season? Okay, so there's two foci. Well, we'd like to have null models that incorporate those kinds of things. How do we do that? Well, let's go back to Albert Einstein. In 1905, his dissertation was published on the motion required by molecular kinetic theory of heat. One chapter of his dissertation described what's called Brownian motion, the random movement of particles. This was part of the development of the proof of the existence of atoms before that was accepted. Okay, what does that show? Well, if we start at a fixed point and animals move at random out from that, we can, in fact, using Einstein's formulas, predict what the probability of use would be over time. That's what it looks like. If they start at point A, randomly move and then come back, and then randomly move and come back, completely random movements from that point, but coming back to it, doing that over and over and over again, that's the distribution we get. It's a circular, normal distribution. It's the fundamental of all sort of multivariate statistics that's based on normal distributions. And there's the formula for it. The probability of finding animals at time t is a normal distribution with a one parameter A, the central point, sort of the mean location, and then a variance, sigma squared, which is a function of time. How long did they spend moving before they came back? So that's the formula for it. It's very nice and straightforward. And in fact, we've used that formula forever in a little bit different form than when we applied a, a home range estimation method called the bivariate normal. Does that really make sense? in biology. Well, look, here's an interesting <clears throat> example from Elton in 1958. <clears throat> he looked at the, the spread of muskrats when they were introduced here in Europe. I don't know if you can see the background here. And then how they spread through time. And what does that look like? It looks like exactly the kind of theoretical distribution that we were talking about. So in fact, that idea of a normal distribution describing their pattern of use movement from a central place makes tremendous biological sense. Now, if we're going to use these null models, how do we choose which null model? Well, we can actually apply selection criteria based on 
uh, information theory methods. We can do that if we can calculate the likelihood of a model. So if we have home range models that are based on a utilization distribution like a normal, we can in fact do that. But for a minimum convex polygon or a kernel density estimate, we can't do that. So we have to use models that are based on some kind of parametric distribution. That's fundamental to our home range estimate. So I'm going to show you a cool new one that we came up with called the exponential power function. In fact, it has three parameters. Okay, one is the central location, where the distribution is in the center of it. I'll use the pointer here again. Where's the center of it? Then there's a scale function which says how far does it spread out. That's like the variance of a normal <laughs> distribution. And then there's a third parameter called C, which is the shape. And it's the magic one that really is clever. So if we have a shape C of 1, we get, in fact, a circular normal distribution, kind of what we'd expect for central place foraging. But if the value of C is 0.5, it's the same thing that's a flat-topped, and it doesn't wander out so far, a squashed sort of bell to the center. And if it takes a value of 0.1, it's perfectly flat-topped and just drops off very quickly. That's the kind of thing we might expect for territorial animals, that they would have very heavy, intense use within area, and it drops off very quickly quickly at the edges, because another male has a territory there that ensures they don't cross into there. So that's a neat alternative to a bivariate normal or circular normal sort of distribution. We call it an exponential power function. Okay, I'm going to show you some examples of doing that. So we used information theory to apply this to a variety of species, and this is one of the papers that was published in Ecology that you have in your set. We used the bivariate normal, the exponential power, and then we added a two-mode circular normal mix so we could have two modes where the animals moved out from. They don't have to be same in height. One could be high and one could be low. Or we could have a two-mode bivariate normal mix so they could be squashed bells in some way. In fact, you can estimate all of those with maximum likelihood. You can calculate AIC for them. So let me show you what you get. Here's some cool examples that are in the paper. Like beginning down here at the bottom right for golden cheek warblers in Texas, in fact, a bivariate normal distribution described their home range pretty darn well. An elk in Starkey Experimental Forest, a two-mode circular normal mixed actually described it. So there's a normal distribution centered here and a normal distribution centered here, and they're mixed together. So that's a cool null model. Now look at some of these others, a two-mode bivariate normal mix here for black briars gave a remarkably complex estimate of the null model of home range. And likewise, for a turtle, a two-mode bivariate mix, you can see it's two modes that the variances are in opposite directions sort of thing. Now, which is the best model for a particular set of data? Well, we can calculate AIC values for these because they're parametric models. So looking here at our warbler, there the, bring my thing up, we had 32 observations and the lowest AIC value was for the bivariate normal as I showed you. Now that bivariate normal actually has six parameters. So the AIC value calculates the negative log likelihood and it penalizes it for the parameters. So the more parameters, the better the model needs to be. But you can see then that far and away the bivariate normal was the best. Likewise for a bobcat, a circular uniform turned out that negative exponential power turned out. They're very territorial. So it in fact described it really well. For elk, a bivariate normal worked. Now for the turtle, for the black bear and for the hawk, all of those, a two-mode bivariate normal, all were the best models. And note that that has 11 parameters, but as you would bet then, the data sets are somewhat larger data sets to support those. And in fact, that's typical. You don't have enough data for very few observations to be able to have much support for a much more complex model. How do you do these analysis? 
Well, that's one of the programs. So let me jump out of this for a second. And those of you who have gone ahead and installed that stuff onto your computer, let me go to the directory that I put these things in. So I suggest that you store them just on your C drive. I have a directory there on mine called the Synoptic Space Model. And that's what it looks like if you save that stuff on the flash drive. And it has the Animal Space Use 1.3 program there. So if you open that, it has an installation program. You just run that, unzip it, and then do the installation. And it'll bring up the software program for you. Also, if I go back, you can see that other things there. I actually teach this sort of stuff in some. So I have two labs that would take you through the two things that we're going to do right here as our um, sort of demo. Likewise, there's the publications that I mentioned. There's PDFs of all of those papers. And then there's the synoptic model. So this has a bunch of R code and output from that that we're going to run through here in just a second after we go ahead and run our animal space use. And then there's here's the PowerPoint things that are um, sort of versions of this that I made here available for you. So one is the, the handout, and the other one is the, actually the PowerPoint. OK, so let's go ahead. If you have the thing installed on your program, you can open the Animal Space Use program like I'm going to. Let me get rid of some things here before I do that so you can see this thing a little better. OK, so it comes up, tells you this is the Animal Space Use software. First thing it asks you is, what kind of data are you going to run? And the two choices are, my data are assumed to be temporally independent observations, or I have serially correlated data that we can use a Brownian bridge movement model on. So if you have GPS short interval data, you can use the Brownian bridge. You can't use necessarily the synoptic model that's for fixed location sort of stuff. It's intended for movement tracks, like the things that we're being shown in the introduction. We're going to go ahead and do some temporally independent data. OK, and then it asks, what do you want to do? Well, you can estimate the home range, or you can estimate the home range corrected for observation bias. So one of the papers is my students and I have worked a lot on the issue of GPS data. You don't get as good a coverage when you have dense canopy coverage and so forth. You can correct for that bias. We don't have time to talk about that. We're just going to do the estimated home range. But you can run all that stuff here. You can run all this in the software. OK, then you have what kind of input data do you want to bring in? Do you want to use an ESRI layer, a shape file, or do you want to use a text file? You can, those are fine. Either one works fine. I'm going to do it with the text file just to demo it for you. And then it asks you to load the input locations file, so you have to direct it. And it will automatically go, if you put the thing where I said on your C drive, it'll instantly go to this set of example data. I'm going to choose one of the data sets on boreal owls that one of my students and I, Greg Hayward, worked on a whole bunch. So we have one individual data set. So when I ask that, it opens that file. And you can see it comes back and tells me where that thing was stored. And it tells me that it had 22 locations. So it's just a small data set. The kind of data that we got, this study was actually done 30 years ago. So it's the kind of data. It spent enormous. He's camped in the wilderness areas for four winters to gather this data, skiing around. So, But it's amazing the kind of analyses you can do with that. So we're going to go ahead and use that. And what do we want to do? Well, you can estimate a home range using the selected model that you choose. And it'll output x, y coordinates and the probabilities, the PDF for you. Or you can compare selected models. So that's the first thing we typically want to do. Let's compare different models. And we use information theory to do that. So for that um, boreal owl, let's compare an exponential power model, a one-mode bivariate normal, a two-mode bivariate circle mix, and a two-mode bivariate normal mix. OK, so I can just choose those. Here on the right, it tells you how many parameters each of those have. You can actually do fixed kernel and adaptive kernels, but we don't have time to talk about that. There's some reasons sometimes for doing that stuff, but we're not going to cover that. So I hit next. Now it's going to take it a minute. 
It's going to go through those 22 observations. It's going to do maximum likelihood estimation of the parameters. Whoops, it's done already. Of all those models, it calculates the maximum likelihood parameters, and then it, in fact, calculates the information theory. So it gives you AIC values here on the right and the minus log likelihood stuff. And so now we can compare those models and say which one of them, in fact, is the best model. Well, which one is the best? AIC, you know, you want the one. It's a, it's a disparity between the model and the predictions. It's the disparity between the observations and the predictions. So you want it to be as small a value as possible. So in this case, that is the, the two-mode bivariate normal mix. That's what it said is the best model. And it says that that differs in AIC by 7 from the second most uh, useful model, which is the bivariate normal. Now, why would that be? Well, this is winter, breeding season, mixed. So the birds had two focuses of their home range. They had a nest site during part of the year. They had a roost site during part of the year. So it makes sense that you would have two mode, and it identified that as being the best. Now, what does it mean that the difference in AIC between that model and the Bivariate normal is seven. Does that tell us anything that's useful? There's a magic value for delta AICs. We call it two. Why is two the magic value? Well, because if you do a likelihood ratio test to evaluate is the, the model with the lower one significantly better than the one with the larger value, you would reject at the 0.05 level if the delta AIC is two or larger. So in fact, we would say this is significantly the best model. OK, get the idea? OK, now you can go back and do all kinds of other things. We have some cool stuff in here for kernels. I don't know if we don't have a lot of time to look at that, so we won't do that. I'm just going to skip on. But you can explore this thing on your handout. There's a tutorial about how to run the program and all the details. There's lots of example data sets and so forth. But we don't have time to do those now. We're going to skip over them. OK, any questions about this animal space use and testing which is the best model a bunch of set? Yes? One of the problems with AIC and those things is you, you, you really ought to be adjusting for some lack of better than the best model. So is there any way you can evaluate whether that model you said was best is really fitting your data? Yeah. You can for some kinds of things. I often do a quasi R square sort of thing whenever I use AIC. Unfortunately, you can't really do that in this data set. So there isn't some simple way to do that, but I agree absolutely. So for example, you want to look at that fit and compare it to the distribution of your locations. And you have to at least on a qualitative basis evaluate it. Do you have a question or comment? Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, um, AIC by itself doesn't tell you sort of how well the model really describes the data. So is there anything besides the AIC? And as I said, ideally, things like a quasi R square gives you a measure of how good the model describes. It's not so straightforward to do that for this. OK, continuing on. What, do we, what we want to do next is I want to get you started on how you then do a synoptic model. OK, so I'm going to open R, particular version of it that I have here. It's not a, it runs just fine on any of the recent versions. OK, and the first thing you need to do is you need to. Oh, good. Thank you for pointing that out. Great. Sorry, it doesn't show on my screen what all it. Is that one okay? Can you see it over there okay? Okay. Okay, so the first thing, this package actually, the R stuff uses a uh, package called mass, which is a set of nice functions. So, whoops, I don't want to go that way. I want to say.
here it is. Okay, so I'm going to choose this mass thing and, and load it. <clears throat> okay, now the software, I'm going to use one of these GUIs, one of these graphical user interface. The one I like is called 10R to open up that R script that I provided on there. In fact, I provided a couple versions of it. So I want to open that. I'm going to open the one that was had a title 7-9-27 workshop. I teach this in all a bunch of workshops about this topic, so I'm just going to open one of those. Okay, so let's now look at this R script. So it tells you this is the synoptic model for analyzing animal space use. It's based on a general framework R code that was provided by Devin Johnson. Okay, he wrote a paper that was published the same year as our stuff came out. He's a statistician, and, and so we used his code and modified it because it was much more powerful than the stuff we had written. So that's the source of the thing. The first thing, there's a bunch of little numbered here. So these numbered, anything with a, if you don't know R, anything with a, with a pound sign in front of it is a comment that's not used. So comment one it's telling us that we want to set the working directory with input files. So you set the working directory to a particular file. So I have it set for if you install it where I suggested you install it. So you can just change that to a different working directory where you have your data stored. Second, it says choose a file containing the functions for the general framework. And so that's here. So that's the name of it. You shouldn't have to change that. That's stuff that you want to just leave alone. Then it says, choose the locations file. So you want to input a set of locations that animals were observed at, and you put it, write it out as a simple text file. And this is clever because you can put a comma here and put another file in double quotes, and a comma and another double file. You can batch a whole series of different animals in this thing very simply. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it the same. Then it says, number four, specify which variables will be used and use a one to specify a variable that will be used and a zero for variables that will not be used. So as I go down a little bit, the models list here. So you have a whole list. So the first one here, models list one, this is actually the model with no covariates. This is the bivariate normal model. You always have to run whatever your null model is first, so it always is there. And we have on here the bivariate normal or the exponential power. You can use either of those as null models. Then you put a list here after that of the other variables that you want to run. And so here's listed the covariate. So you have to create a file of observations, locations, and then you create another file that's, that's a coverage of the entire rectangular area or the area within the boundary like of that um, rhino preserve. And that gives, at every grid cell point, it gives the coverage, the, the value for the covariates that you think are good predictors. Okay, and if you look on the data, on the examples that we give you, it's all there and it shows you how to do those and set those things up and so forth. Okay, so now what I've done is I've said model two is going to be, it's going to use variable one and variable two, and right above here it lists those as elevation and elevation squared. It turns out that the, the data for the caribou, they occurred in a zone that, in fact, highest elevation and lowest elevation were not good places. So they, in fact, preferred a middle. So we need to have a, a, a little more complicated probability of use, it goes up and there's an intermediate value. And you just do that by just put, doing a squared term. Then the third variable is distance to road. The fourth one is a different measure of me way of measuring that, the density of roads within a, a cell. The fourth, fifth is slip, slope, distance, shrub, land, and so forth. So these are all variables. So you can see my first model is the null model. My second model then has elevation. The third model adds to elevation road distance and so forth. There's a bunch more here. I have them commented out because we don't have time to run all those. But that's the way you com comment things out to only run part of your models or whatever. Okay, and that's pretty much what you have to set up. So now to run this thing in R, 
I'm just basically going to grab that, copy it out of my little GUI here with Control C, and then I'm going to go into my R package here and do Control V, and it starts reading all those lines of the script and ex executing them. So that's starting to run things now. Okay, so it's an interpreted language, so it's slow. So it's going to take a while. When I run all, say, like nine models, it's liable to take an hour and a half to run that. So we're just going to have some of it running, but you can do it on your own. Take a look at it, what your output is. Okay, let's jump back then now to our presentation. And let me continue talking for the time that I have left to show you then what sort of things you get from that stuff. Okay. Okay, so the seventh part is the state the ideas hypotheses in the form of multiple parametric syn synoptic models where the parameters express the effects of key ecological factors or processes. They are feasible to estimate with maximum likelihood methods, and these competing models can be compared using information theoretic methods. So we talked about those for the rhino. So what does it look like? Well, as we said, <clears throat> males defend fixed territories within a boundary fence. So we define the XY coordinate stuff to only include within the boundary fence. There's nothing outside. There can't be any probability of use outside of that. It solves that problem. You don't have to worry about kernels running over the thing. Second, we, we thought the exponential power model would be the best one, so we're going to test that and see. The steep terrain, we can use a, a slope sort of thing. Preferred forage, I said we use NDVI. And then males optimize breeding opportunities by spending most time where females concentrate. Janet recorded XY coordinates of females so that we have a good kernel density map of females. That's a perfect use of kernels. That's what it estimates, density. So it's great for that. Okay. So the null model is no environmental covariates. Exponential power plus a park boundary. The habitat model is the null model plus open cover type and percent slope. The social model then is the null model plus female density. And we could have a combined model that combined all of those things. In fact, when we run AIC selection, what do we get? Well, what is this? What is this synoptic model? Well, let me show you, illustrate it. Here's a centrally, random, a centrally biased random walk. Here's the form of the synoptic model. <clears throat> okay, so the synoptic model says we have a null model, like a random walk from a center, multiplied by a weighting function. In symbols, f of u is the probability of use at x, that's an xy coordinate at a particular point, is equal to the null model f of 0 of x times a weighting function where the weighting function might be e to the beta times h sub x where h is a particular habitat. So what this shows is if you have an animal moving at random, this is a simulation that John Horn did for his dissertation, he took the, this being the random movement if an animal just started here and walked at random out but now if he put a habitat here that was preferred so they were less likely to leave it, here's then the probability of use that he got. It fell down from that high, but it jumped way up in that preferred habitat. Okay, you can estimate that then. We can describe the parameters of both the null model and the selection coefficient betas are, are estimated by maximizing the likelihood. And this is what it looks like. That f of u is equal to the availability times a weight divided by the integral over all of the area of that availability times the weight. And this is again, so it's kind of in words, the home range model plus the is equal to the null model times the proportional change. And we can assemble those predictive models. So look at the models and here's the coverages for those predictive models. So percent slope is one. Woodland, this is the NDVI map, 
And then the female density was a kernel density map of locations. So that's the third one. When we ran those, well, we can fit competing models. So here's the first of our null models. We compared the bivariate normal here and then the exponential power as the second one across each animal. So here's male 5, male 9, and male 25. The combined summing those, we end up with dramatically better for the exponential power. So in fact, that's the best null model rather than the bivariate normal. Here's then what happens when you run individual of these synoptic models. Here's the exponential power. If we add to it the park boundary, there's the AIC values. The, here's if you add female density. Here's if you add the open and the percent slope. And here's then the combined. And you can see that the lowest AIC value for this male turns out to be that combined model. And it's significantly better than the alternatives. So they're simultaneously doing both of those things at once. They're looking at the environmental resources and females. And our null model is that they're defending their territory. OK, so you get the idea. So the combined model is the best model. Now look at the maps that it draws. Here's then the probability density function, the home range for each of those three males. OK? so. In red for male 1, male 5 that we were talking about, the highest probability of use grading into the lowest at blue. So a high probability of use. Why is there a concentration of use right there, do you think? Well, look at the coverages. What's located there? Females. Female density is very high here. That's where their highest use is. What about... Why is it sort of this flecked pattern? Because that's where the grassland is. And look now, there's holes in that distribution, dramatic holes. Why are they there? Well, look at the slope. That's where there's little granite outcrops. It captures every bit of that and describes their home range. Likewise for female, I mean, sorry, male nine, Male 25 is kind of weird. This looks more like a kernel sort of thing. <coughs> that, like you had too big a smoothing parameter. Why did we get that? Well, when we showed this to Janet, she said, awesome, that male, number 25, for half of, his, the, of her study, he was not territorial. There was a territorial male that was defending the territory. This male had to avoid him. So he stayed in that area, but avoided the male, he's dispersed. Once that male, the territorial male died, this guy took over. That's why that one looked like that. So I'm out of time. There's lots more things. You can look at parameter estimates. And you can go on. There's a bunch more stuff here. But I hope that then gets you started. Switching the computers out. We might have time for one or two. Yeah, so if, if there are any questions, we'll take a couple. Yes, please. Uh, for variables like maybe a DBI that evolve over time, do you just have to choose a window over which you kind of assume that they're not going to stationary? Okay, her question was for a variable like NDVI that varies over time, do you have to choose a window? In fact, I have a great example that I think is on this data set. We did a really neat study on cougars in Yellowstone National Park where we felt a key variable was snow depth. And we had, you know, there's now there's awesome snow coverages available that you can get from USGS. And it gives you like a two-week window of snow depth and condition. We got those for Yellowstone Park. And we, in fact, then created a series of two-week coverages of snow depth and we use those for each set of locations. So you just match them up. When you look at the file for your availability and for your locations, you would name over to the right the availability file for that location. So you can have a set of ones that are the same when this, that variable stays the same, and then you change it for another time period when it changes. So you can incorporate that right into it. You bet. Other questions? Oh, yes. Go ahead.
Yeah, absolutely. So it's written in R. So if you have a movement model, a different sort of movement model, isn't there another person going to come yeah, they're, here? They're getting in there. Okay. Um, so if you have a different model, if you can program it in R as a null model and use that as your beginning, if you look at the code, I didn't go through the details of it, it starts with that null model, estimates those parameters using maximum likelihood, and then when it brings in another variable, it takes those parameters from that earlier model as the starting point, and it starts modifying them, and it maximizes simultaneously those parameters for that null model and the new betas for the selection coefficient. So you, absolutely, you can do that just fine right on this code. Another question? When you run the data for multiple individuals combined, so you would estimate the reserve selection coefficient based on the data of multiple individuals? Yeah, in fact, the data, if you look at the, the stuff on the PDF or go to the website or look at one of the papers, there's a paper there by Adam uh, Wells and I that used the mountain goat data. And it actually, what we did was we did an individual pattern of space use estimate for each animal across about, like I think we had published 35 animals, of which 20 were females and 15 were males. And then we combined those. We calculated like the, we, add, we did population statistics, estimate what's the mean selection coefficients for each of the habitat variables, and then how much did they vary. We used that to evaluate if they were significant or not significant across. So yes, absolutely you can do that. The way I recommend you do it is that you do individual animals at a time, and then you have population statistics that you calculate on those. So use the selection coefficients that you got, that you estimated for each animal as your observations, and now you calculate population estimates of their mean selection coefficients and calculate confidence intervals and bounds on them, how much variation there is in the population and so forth. You could conceivably have animals that you only had 20 observations of this animal, 10 of that, 5 of that. You could pool those together, but then you're doing something you need to be aware of. You're weighting the animal with multiple observations more than you're weighting the animals that have less. And that's very dangerous. So that there isn't a way that I know of to do a weighted sort of thing quite yet to do that. But, that's a, but you certainly could combine them from all your data and weight them. And in some ways it makes sense if you have an animal, you have four times as many observations as another one, you only have fifth. It makes some sense to weight it four times as heavily as the other. And yeah. It's conceivable, but you have to think about that, explain it very clearly to people who you're presenting it to. Other questions? 